Hi everybody, this is Professor Ellis with Technical Writing. This is week 11 of spring 2021. How's everybody doing this week? I hope that you're all doing well. Everybody's staying healthy. Um, you continue to mask up, and maintain social distancing from others as much as you can. And if you get a chance to get vaccinated, please do so. I can't encourage you to do that enough. Um, I finally got an appointment for my first um, shot. It'll be uh, Wednesday after my office hours. Uh, so remember my office hours Wednesday are from 3 until 5 p.m. And then after my office hours are over, I'm going to go get my shot at uh, 6 o'clock. So make sure that if you get that same opportunity, uh, you jump on it uh, because we all need to get vaccinated as quickly as we can uh, to try to get our city out of this um, pandemic mess, uh, something we all have to work towards. Um, but now, you know, that being said, I obviously know that everybody is probably stressed out uh, with not just the work in our class, but all your other classes. I uh, get reports from students that are having trouble you know, juggling not just the work in our class, but the work in their other classes. Uh, the work that they have to do on their jobs, you know, taking care of their families. Um, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of things going on that um, provide you know, new challenges um, on top of the challenges we all face during the pandemic. So keep in mind, uh, as we get closer to the end of the semester, which isn't that far off at this point, um, you know, we only got a few more weeks of lectures, um, and then beyond that, just a little bit of time before grades are due. So we're getting down to the wire at this point. Um, but as we get closer, if you need to reach out, please remember you can email me at jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. Uh, I've got my weekly office hours, and I can also meet with you by appointment. Um, you know, one thing I just want to remind folks about, because uh, occasionally it does happen, if you make an appointment uh, for us to meet outside of my office hours, please stick to it. Otherwise, let me know what's going on, because uh, obviously you know, things can come up, and you might not be able to make a meeting. But if we do set a time for that outside of my normal office hours, it's just a professional courtesy. Uh, to let me know even after the fact if something's come up and you weren't able to make it because I, I don't need to know uh, anything about like specifics because uh, we are all adults and I trust you all. You, you're my students. So, I mean, there's going to be trust between me and you, uh, but it's important just to maintain those lines of communication because uh, certainly uh, if anything comes up on my end, I will let you all know right away. Um, because I don't want you, like you, in a, in a sense, you know, sitting in the dark about what's going on. But hopefully, I won't need to let you guys know about anything like that. I'm going to try to be as healthy as I can and get through the semester because I want to see you all successful. I want to see you all finish with good grades that you want, uh, that you've earned. Um, but you know, the earning part, that's on you. You got to bring it to every class, to every assignment. Um, there has to always be something there. A deliverable is the word that I keep using. That's the, the artifact, the thing that you make for each of the assignments. Um, so just kind of in review, remember to make sure that you're getting all the weekly writing assignments done. If you've missed some, go back and do them and then send me an email saying, Professor Ellis, I just got caught up on, on this particular weekly writing assignment. Let me know which week it was. That helps me go back and check it off and give you that credit you've earned. Um, that's not a problem, but you got to let me know when you've done that because if I've already checked off everyone else's without you giving me that, that cue, I won't know to go do that for you. So again, that's where communication is very vital and important uh, for us to make the class work asynchronously this way. Um, the same is true for any of the past assignments. Uh, for the main projects, you know, your article summary, the expanded definition project, uh, the instruction manual that uh, most folks have turned in, but I know some folks are still turning those in. That's okay too. Uh, but any of these that need to get caught up, uh, done correctly, etc., uh, just get it done. And then let me know that you've turned it in if you turn it in after a deadline has passed. That's not a big deal um, because, you know, I'm, you structured the class in a way 
to give everyone the latitude. Like those folks that can just hammer it out, get it done, it's off your plate, you're finished. But you know, occasionally things are going to creep in that may cause someone to have to shift focus away from the class for like a week or two. But once you come back, get it done, let me know, and then I'll be able to grade it for you, okay? Um, another thing to keep in mind though, as we get closer to the end of the semester, make sure that uh, we get everything in by the very end of the semester because you know I have to have time to grade and then get those grades turned in uh, and I'll fill you all in more on that uh, later but you know we can take a look at the syllabus real quick before I get into today's outline so here I am on the OL 83 course site the same is true for OL 88 um, I go to syllabus And we're week 11, so week 11 is April 21st, week 12 is the 28th, week 13 is May 5th, week 14 is May 12th, and then week 15 is May 19th. Uh, and that's going to be the end of the semester. And so I'll look at uh, the college um, calendar uh, when we get closer to that date uh, about if there is any leeway with this due date of the end of the semester but as of right now and you know this from the syllabus this is when everything is officially due May 19th okay why not just look things up in the present right so I just did a quick Google search and you can see here I have brought up the, the City Tech spring 2021 academic calendar uh, this is something that you know, is publicly available if you're not familiar with it, you can just do a Google search for City Tech um, College Calendar or Academic Calendar, and this PDF should be one of the first links that come up or the page where this PDF is linked from. Um, so the official last day of our class, that would be the fifth the, the day of the 15th, 15th week of class, according to the syllabus is Wednesday May 19th um, that is going to be the official due date uh, for uh, everything in the class but I will be able to accept work up until uh, the end of final exams so in our class there is no final exam everything is based around the projects that you're doing in the class the individual projects in the first part of the semester and then the um, collaborative projects in the second half of the semester so you can see that final exams here uh, run from May 19th to 25th and then May 25th is the last day of finals this is what are called, are called uniform finals for some of the departments on campus that is going to be the last day that I can accept any work from any student in any of my classes because as you can see here May 28th is when final grades are due so I need that time in order to calculate my grades and if you can imagine I go back through all the work that's been given to me to make sure that I haven't missed anything uh, sometimes like your know, student might not remember to email me that they turned in something late and that'll be the time where I might be able to catch it. Now, you shouldn't rely on that. As I said before, you gotta email me to go back and check on something that you might have turned in late. That's your responsibility. That's the way to be sure because I'll acknowledge those emails that you sent. And so you have like, in a sense, you know, a paper trail for that. But if I'm not notified, occasionally I do catch some work that students have turned in and of course I'll grade it and add it into um, their average in the class. But that takes you know, some days to do that because I want to be very thorough, I don't want to miss anything, and I want to make sure all my calculations are correct uh, so that all the points that you earn are what go into your average in my class. So May 25th, and I'll make a note of this, I'll make an addendum to the syllabus so that you're aware of this, May 25th is going to be the absolute final date that I can accept anything in the class. No exceptions. That's it. Because I have to turn in grades um, because there is no after for that. Uh, at that point, if I don't turn in grades, um, someone's going to have my head. Okay, 
So we got to make sure that things are done by May 25th. And I'll again make an addendum to our syllabus down here at the bottom uh, to say that that is the absolute final date that I can accept work. Okay? And if anybody has questions about that, just shoot me an email. Not a big deal. Uh, but that should give you a little bit more breathing room to make sure that you get all your work done and particularly with the collaborative project that you have time to um, work things out with your team to get everything finally assembled and for you to write your own uh, report on your contributions and the contributions of your teammates. All right, so that's a very long-winded introduction to today's class. So why don't we take a look at what uh, are some of the planned things we need to talk about today. Uh, I do want to uh, mention uh, kind of an extension to the extra credit from last week uh, for the Literary Arts Festival. I'll explain that in a second. We're going to continue with the collaborative team-based project um, talk about team communication, make sure that you are getting everybody that as much as humanly possible involved. Uh, we'll talk about the different parts of the research report, what goes into them, and then finally we'll talk about the homework and weekly writing assignment. The homework is going to be conducting and compiling research for your report because by this point you should have hopefully decided as a team what your topic will be on your research report. And then for the weekly writing assignment, after you've decided what you are researching, you need to delegate responsibilities in terms of everyone doing research, like you could do a free-for-all, just say everybody go out and gather as much information as you can about the problem. You might delegate two people to research the problem and two people to research solutions. Uh, or some combination of these things. Maybe everybody finds one source about the problem and one source about the solution. Um, and what you'll do individually for this week's le weekly writing assignment is tell me in a very short memo that you write, each team member will write, let me know like what uh, research you are contributing and what you've found so far. Uh, so basically it's just kind of a way of keeping me in the loop about the work you're contributing to the research report. Because again, as I said in our last class, while you might delegate certain responsibilities uh, for some aspects of the collaborative projects deliverables, such as the website or um, maybe organizing your uh, oral visual presentation um, video that you're going to make, uh, but as far as the research report, the writing that goes into it needs to be done by all the team members. Each needs to be contributing equally or in some division that makes it equal for everyone. Um, some folks may want, you, know, you may decide together that some folks want to primarily focus on doing the research um, and maybe writing up summaries of that research and then handing that off to other team members to actually write parts of the report. That's also, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but that's something you as a team have to decide. So we'll get into that and making sure that you are communicating uh, in just a minute. But first, let's talk about that extra credit. So if you look at the top of both the OL83 and OL88 um, course sites, you will see that I've posted a new um, announcement, extra credit literary arts festival video this time. And I realized not everyone was able to attend uh, the Literary Arts Festival because you might have other classes or you might be at work uh, or otherwise busy. But if you do want to claim this extra credit, now the video of the event, about two hours long, is now available on YouTube. And so to get the extra credit, watch the Literary Arts Festival, listen to the, the stories and the writing and the artwork of um, the, your fellow City Tech students. Uh, you can hear the introduction from our Chancellor. I mean, this was a really big deal. The Chancellor of CUNY, of our entire university system, for the first time in the 40 years that we've been running the Literary Arts Festival at City Tech, this is the first time a Chancellor has gone to the event and, and opened it. Uh, so this was you know, really a recognition of the hard work that City Tech students do that the Chancellor wanted to come and recognize that. I think that's a really big deal and that reflects highly on you guys. Um, 
so you can watch this and of course the toward the end is Stacy Ann Chin um, a very popular and uh, outspoken and influential um, poet and writer uh, performance artist um, you know she shares some of her work uh, and responds to some of the students work uh, from the literary arts festival so that was really cool uh, but watch the video it's about two hours long um, and then all you have to do is write me an email that's about 250 words long that's one page double spaced of writing and you tell me what you got out of it you who did you hear speak so like include names what they talked about um, and you can just focus on like what maybe resonates the most with you what you thought was the most important or what you really struck you the most that you that really spoke to you um, those are the kinds of things that I'd like to hear about. Um, write that up. Make sure that all your sentences are complete, grammatically correct. Um, I mean, this is another opportunity for you to practice your writing, essentially. And that's ultimately, I mean, there's two reasons I'm giving you this extra credit. One is so that you practice your writing to help you become a better writer. But two, also so that you are involved in the things that are going on at City Tech. Because uh, even though we are all absent, you know, in different places, and not on campus right now because of the pandemic, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be taking advantage of these types of opportunities. Because uh, I can speak from my own experience as an undergraduate at Georgia Tech, that the going to these kinds of events are some of the things that made me who I am today. Um, for example, um, one of the, you know, two of the memories I have of these events uh, when I was you know, much younger, um, one time I got to meet Stephen Wolfram, uh, who came to Georgia Tech's campus uh, to talk about a new release of Wolfram uh, software's uh, Mathematica. Uh, this is software that you use for mathematical modeling um, and other types of computational math work. Um, and even though I'm an English professor, ever since that day I have been a lifelong hobbyist with Mathematica. I like playing with it uh, and using it uh, and I've even used it on research projects at City Tech um, designing ways to teach math uh, to students in different ways uh, that leverage both Mathematica uh, for doing the, the learning of the math but then combining it with science fiction stories that use math as a part of the, the plot of the story. Um, so I think that's really neat that, that if I hadn't gone to that event, if I hadn't met Stephen Wolf, Wolfram and heard his words and got to talk to him, uh, I don't know if I would be doing that now with Mathematica. Um, and then another example that you know, kind of connects to what we're hearing about in the news right now on Mars uh, with the uh, Perseverance uh, rover and then you're the, the small um, satellite uh, helicopter that flew successfully for the first time on Mars the other day. If you can imagine back in 1996 we had never sent a probe to Mars that could move on the surface. All the probes that we had sent beforehand were stationary. It's like once they landed that's it. They're there. They do all their work in that one spot. Um, but in 1996 we uh, or earlier we had launched uh, another mission to uh, Mars that included Sojourner. And Sojourner was the first rover uh, to go around Mars. It, it wasn't as long lived as those that came after it, but it was a proof of concept, just like that little helicopter, uh, rotocopter that took off on Mars, uh, uh, yes, er, Sunday into Monday. Uh, so it's like that first stepping stone. And so, I mean, that's something that I'm going to carry with me for my whole life, being able to learn from these NASA scientists, you know, all the engineering and the science that went into making those early rovers. It helps me appreciate today, I think, more the work that's continuing to be done to help us understand, um, you know, not only our world, but our solar system and our universe. Um, so any of these kinds of events that you hear about, take advantage of them. I know you can't go to all of them. That would be impossible for anyone. Um, but sometimes you do have to make a point and set some things aside so that you can prioritize these kinds of events because they can have a lasting influence on you. Not just in terms of what you learn, but it might open doors, you might make connections, you might, it might help with your networking. Um, so there's a lot of different ways these things can be beneficial to you. Alright, so 
that's the Literary Arts Festival, extra credit. Um, take advantage of it if you can. Um, and again, that extra credit can go toward uh, replacing or taking the place of a missed weekly writing assignment. Or if you've done all the weekly writing assignments, I'll put those points somewhere else um, to help out as you know, whatever I think will boost your grade the most. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to you, you say like you know, it has to go in this one place versus another. If I see you doing this kind of extra credit, I apply it where I think it's going to help you the most. And whenever I do grades at the end of the semester, I'll be able to see that um, when I got everything in front of me opened up. All right, so that's extra credit. So let's continue with the collaborative team-based project. So first off, team communication. I've, I've heard from a number of teams since last week um, who are having difficulty getting all team members on board for the team communication. And again, it's each team's you know, responsibility as well as uh, your decision about how you want to communicate besides email. Because obviously you have access to email. I've sent you the email that includes all of your uh, team members' email addresses that you could reply all to at any point in time. Um, so that's, you know, that's like the foundation, right? But then on top of that, you as a team should decide on a faster, more, a wider bandwidth type of communication than email. Um, you know, some folks are, you set up uh, Discord servers, uh, some people are using WhatsApp. Um, anything that works for you all, you get to decide. I don't want to tell you as far as the communication side of it what you have to use but you as a team need to decide what you all are able um, to, to leverage to maintain communication. Because we are all asynchronous, having a good communication medium uh, beyond email is absolutely uh, essential to a successful project. Um, so for those folks that are having trouble reaching people, if you haven't already figured this out, you need to be sending more emails okay so like if you just sent one email to your team and saying hey we're going to be using slack for our communication meeting you need to sign up at this link and then you don't hear from like three of your other team members only say like two of them responded and, and joined slack well you need to send new emails directly to those three people maybe one a day two a day until you can hopefully get their attention um, because you can imagine that we're all receiving tons of email about a lot of different things um, and it's also possible that for some students they may not check their email but once a week because they're otherwise working I'm not saying that I agree with students doing that I would prefer students check their email more frequently um, but I'm just trying to point out the reality to everyone in the class so that we can set our expectations about when we may hear back from people via email. Now, if there are you know, team members that after you've sent multiple emails to over several days and you still don't hear from them, I do want you to reach out to me and let me know who specifically in your team uh, you haven't heard back from and who hasn't joined whatever team communication system you've set up that you, the other team members and yourself have chosen to use um, and also if you do hear from some team members but they say um, that they can't use whatever that you know communication medium that you have selected there's a couple of ways to work around that okay first off you can ask the person what can you do um, and like let's say for example um, they don't like slack for whatever reason well you might ask if they've ever used slack if they could try using Slack since the other team members have maybe agreed that this is the best way for the team to communicate. Um, but if, that's t if they say like for some reason it doesn't work on their phone or they have trouble accessing that website uh, for, for Slack, for whatever reason, you can also ask them for alternatives because for any team to be successful, it's important that all team members 
are troubleshooters. All team members need to work together towards solutions because inside your team to accomplish the task of a project you're going to encounter a thousand problems. You're going to encounter a thousand hurdles. You're going to encounter thousands of challenges. And it's up to all the team members to try to figure out solutions to overcome each challenge, every problem, leap over every hurdle to keep the project moving forward. So if, like for some, you know, whatever it might be, whether it be team communication or another problem you're likely to encounter, uh, if you voice that concern to your team, like, hey, I'm having a problem with this, you ought to be also trying to offer a solution or asking the other team members if they have some insight or some ideas about how we, make sure you use that word we because you are a team and the team's grade is based on what the team does together. Okay, so I mean, if all the team members are trying to work together, then ultimately the whatever you produce as a team is going to be what you amounts to the grade on your collaborative project. So you are a we, you are a collective. You need to own that type of relationship with your teammates. That this isn't something that you are mercenaries working alone in the same way that you were on your individual projects earlier on. At this point, you are, are all in this together. And so you need to comport yourselves toward working together as a team and trying to find solutions they, that allow you to keep the project moving forward toward you know, a successful conclusion. That all being said, again, reach out to me if there are specific concerns, specific students who may not be responding to your emails, uh, but don't reach out to me until you've made every effort on your part to reach out to those students. Um, you know, multiple ways, and then you might even try other ways too, like um, if you, you might be on Facebook, you might see if you can find this other person in your team on Facebook and drop them a message that way. Uh, or another um, social media platform because um, you want to try to see if you can reach out to these folks as best as possible and bring them on board but if you can't that's when you reach out to me and then um, you will we'll put our heads together whether it needs me reach out to them or if I know something um, that's come up I'll let you all know etc so team communication absolutely in essential um, but you know Added to that, just want to remind you all, I've said this before in previous lectures, but I want to say it again, that even though you as a team are responsible for this project and for successful completion and the grade that you get on it, I don't want anyone to be concerned that if there are particular students that never show up, never contribute, that you know, their grade is going to be the same as your grade. No one's getting a free ride on this, okay? Um, but all of the active team members, your grade will depend on the collective effort of your team. And part of that that helps me determine all this is at the end of the project, each team member will individually write a memo that you know, explains their involvement in the project, what they contributed, and what they observed other team members to contribute. That document is sent directly to me. That's not something you're going to be posting on OpenLab for all to read. That way, it's strictly a communication between you and me from you know, each team member individually to me, the professor. That gives me that insight into what's going on in the team that I normally would be able to see when we're meeting in person. Uh, but because we're asynchronous, this is a new, you know, a different way that I can kind of see the dynamic of the team at play uh, when it, it comes to you know, actually evaluating everyone's involvement in the project. Um, but of course, like if there are students that you don't contribute at all, obviously those will be students I have to reach out to, you know, one, find out like you know, what's going on, uh, but also their grade is not going to be based on what the active team members do on the project. So again, just want to make sure everyone understands that nobody gets a free ride on this kind of project. 
Um, but that being said, it is imperative that all the team members do step up in terms of you know, keeping track of delegating responsibility, of being able to maybe have one person take point on different aspects of the project. So one person might be responsible for um, following up with all team members on their research. Doesn't mean that person needs to be responsible for writing the whole research report, but you do need to have someone that is going to you know, be a task master, someone who follows up with people to make sure things get done. Um, that usually helps things move along better than if everyone is left up to their own devices. Not to say that that doesn't work, um, but in my experience, usually it's good to have a task master or someone taking point uh, to keep everybody um, in line so that if maybe they forget, you can be the person to say, hey, you need to follow up on this and get this done so that we can complete the rest of the project. And so it's important for you all to be mindful of how all the different moving parts of the collaborative project are dependent on the work that you do. So especially for the research report that we're going to talk about in more depth today, if you are responsible for providing some of that research and you put it off, well, you're essentially sabotaging your team's effort to produce the research report that everything else is based on. So you can't slack off, you can't let things slide, you can't procrastinate um, as, as an excuse for not doing the work when others depend on this work that you're doing. And this is uh, in wholesale about what workplace best practices are all about. This is what technical writing is all about. That the work that you do, the communication that you produce, the writing that you do that's of a technical nature usually is intended for other people to get their work done. And if you slack off and don't do that work to help others do their work, then you're holding up others from being able to do what they need to be uh, responsible for. Uh, and in the workplace, um, those can be the kinds of things that get you fired. In our classroom, this is a safer place. All that can happen to you is you get a bad grade. Um, and of course, your, your students may hate you for the rest of your life. Uh, so let's not let that happen, okay? Make sure that you're pulling your weight, and if something does come up, you need to reach out to your team right away. Okay, that's the thing to keep in mind. And if something really bad happens, you should loop me into that as well. But for the team projects, anything that's going to affect your team finishing all the different deliverables, always be in communication with your team. Always let them know what's going on. Let them know your availability. Let them know if, um, if and when you may need to push a, a deadline. Um, but if something much bigger comes up, obviously tell your team, but also loop me in at that point. Uh, but you don't have to loop me in on every little thing. Um, it's just if it becomes a, a, something that could affect the overall success of the project, something much bigger. Okay. All right, so that's team communication. So let's get into the research report. So in this part of the lecture, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit more about um, what goes into the research report, what is the purposes of the research that are doing on it, um, and other aspects that hopefully will, will shape your thinking about what this document is. So a research report in general is something that's presenting evidence about something and in our case, it's about a problem. And that problem is in need of a solution. So what you're doing is performing research to learn about the problem, to learn about solutions, so that at the end of the document, you're able to make recommendations. But you can't just make recommendations unless you've learned about the problem and learned about its possible solutions, solutions that have been pursued by others. 
Um, so let's get into more about like these types of things, but just keep in mind, when you're in the workplace, more than likely, you're doing a research report is going to involve research that you've done yourself, primary research, uh, in which case it'll rely more on the actual data that you've collected and you drawing some kind of results from that, that you discuss, that you draw um, conclusions from that discussion, and then provide some kind of recommendations based on um, th those conclusions that you've drawn. And so this type of research you're doing in our class, I'm not expecting you to go out and do primary research. Most of the research you do, you're doing will be secondary research, meaning that you're looking at the research that has been done by others. So what goes into the research report? First off, the research report needs to clearly identify the problem. Um, the problem shouldn't be something that is so large that it's almost impossible to imagine how a document of this size, and again, if we just go back over to the syllabus, it needs be only 4,000 to 6,000 words. Um, so if uh, we do a quick calculation. So 4,000 words turns out to be about 16 pages double spaced. And that's all inclusive, okay? That's going to include um, not just the words you write, but it's going to include all your quotes, your citations, remember you have your parenthetical citations after each quote. You're going to have your works uh, or your references list at the end. That can include a glossary, that can include appendices. All of this um, will combine for this total 4,000 um, words, roughly 16 page document. Now. One thing to keep in mind, like you can see in the syllabus that each team, team member contributes 1,000 to 1,500 words. And this is really the, the marker that I'm going to be looking for um, because I know that in times past there have been situations where like say a team, for whatever reason, might lose two or three members um, where students just either stop coming to class or don't contribute or whatever the problem might be. So if, like let's say your team right now has six members, but after like you know, the next week or two, it's evident that only three people are working on the research report, then we're going to recalibrate your expectation based on how many members you have. And so this measure here, 1,000 to 1,500 words per team member is what I'll be looking at. So I don't want anybody to freak out if you've lost a couple of team members after a week or so uh, that you suddenly still have to do 4,000 words. I'm not going to hold you to that standard. Uh, it's going to be based on this 1,000 to 1,500 words contribution that goes into the total word count for your project. So if, like let's say you have three team members, uh, that's gonna be 3,000 words. If you got four, that's 4,000. If you got five, um, then we're looking for probably more than 4,000 words, okay? I mean, because each team member needs to be making these kinds of contributions. If you have a larger team, you should be doing more work in terms of the research that you do uh, because each team member is doing the research and all that research can be combined. And this is in particular where you're going to be begin seeing how this project is relying on the work that you've done on the earlier projects. In particular, your article summary project at the very beginning of the semester, where you took an article and you summarized it. And I asked you to also include at least one quote in that. That kind of work is what needs to be done now for summarizing, for contextualizing this, these research articles that you find uh, for this part of the project. Now you're also going to have to be doing your own writing as a part of this um, 
And of course the summarization work is your own writing, but it's based on what you've read in the research done by others. Okay, now if anybody has questions about this, please make sure you reach out to me. Um, but again, I don't want, I'm just saying this because I don't want people freaking out if by chance you lose a couple of team members. That the expectations are going to be modified based on how many team members you got. Um, big teams, I need to see a bigger report. Smaller teams, a smaller report. I mean, it's just scalable based on how many team members you have. Okay? And that's that's no and just to be clear, that's no extra work on you know a larger team versus a smaller team, right? Because each individual team member should be contributing X amount of words to the overall research report. Okay? Again, just to be clear. So in the research report, like really before you can dive into your research, you need to clearly identify the problem. And it needs to be something that is it's possible for you to do the research on. It needs to be something that um, is manageable and it needs to be relevant to whatever you're learning in school, whatever your career focus is going to be. Um, I think I gave the example before that nobody in the class, any team, should be doing a research report on, say, COVID-19. All right, or the pandemic in general. But because you are all primarily CST and electrical engineering students, you can define a problem that is tangentially, you remember a tangent uh, you're on a curve, right? That's tangentially connected to COVID-19. And one of the you know, biggest things that you've come out of the pandemic is visualization projects of being able to visualize like um, how many people are sick in a geographical area how many people are getting vaccinated in a geographical area for example or how you do data collection for all of this type of medical information or maybe a problem relating to how um, a computer system should follow uh, HIPAA standards for example which is the law that that keeps um, medical information private. Those are all great problems for this project because they involve computers and technology, but they're also related to something that may be on your mind that isn't necessarily like what your research focus is at City Tech. So those things are okay, but don't do something that's like completely off the deep end, not related to what you're studying here. Why is that? Because again, I want everything you do in my class to be taken out of my class and useful to you. And if you're writing research reports on things that are totally unrelated to what your major is, um, when you're looking for a job in that field, if your research report isn't like really uh, focused on those things, it's not going to be that indicative. It's not going to be positively reflective of you if you want to use it for like a writing sample or as an example of your research skills. So make sure that you as a team are choosing some a problem that you can clearly define that is obviously connected in a strong way to what your majors are. Now as a part of after you define the problem as a part of your research there's two main areas of research that you need to do. The first is learn about the problem. You need to find out about its background, like its you know, history, uh, its context, like what is it related to, who does it affect, um, all of these background aspects of the problem. And so that's, the, that's one big part of the research that you're going to be doing. The second part of your research is to learn about solutions to the problem, because I'm not expecting you all to solve this problem. You, you, this is a project on presenting a report on the research that's out there. Now you're going to be drawing some conclusions and making recommendations based on your own thinking, but that thinking is going to be rooted in the research that you do about solutions to the problem. So again, part of the research is going to be learning about the problem, its background, its history, and you know, what it relates to is context. The other part is going to be solutions to the problem. 
And this is where, again, what is the background of those solutions? What are its history, its context? You know, what things have worked, which things haven't worked, right? That's what our solutions are all about. Which ones seem to work the best, which ones don't? Your research will tell you that. Now, optionally, you can collect some of your own research data as a part of the project. Depending on what you choose for your problem, it may be advantageous for you uh, to do your own primary data collection. And what I mean by this, like for example, um, I've had students in the past do projects on improving um, uh, transit system um, payment methods. And what these students did is they created a poll about you know, what would be the best or what people thought would be the best way for them to be able to pay for access to taking the subway. Um, you know, options like do you want like a refillable card, do you want to use Apple Pay? Do you want to uh, have some other near field communication payment system? Whatever it might be. They made this list of things that they put into a poll using like a Google form and they emailed it out to people. They stopped students in the halls at NAM building, which you know obviously for us is not really a possibility, but you could post it to like you know on Facebook and Twitter and other places where you can reach people and ask folks to fill out the survey and you collect that data and that data could be part of um, the, the research that goes into your report. So but that's optional. I'm not saying you have to do that, but depending on the problem you choose, uh, doing that primary data collection might be helpful to um, what you have to say because that evidence may help guide how you do your research and what you focus on. And then finally, based on what you learn through your research, because I mean, what I'm saying learn, that is your research. You're becoming an expert in this by doing this research on your own. I'm not giving you all these sources. This is something that you're finding on your own using the skills that you should have already built up in uh, previous classes like English 1101 and 1121 maybe classes in your major, but then obviously early in the semester on in technical writing, that you that kind of research that you've been doing. You then take all this information you've learned, you present it in the report, and based on that material you've learned, you get to make recommendations to solve the problem. Okay, and that's the ultimate goal of your research report is making those recommendations that are based on your research. Now, I gave you in the last lecture uh, and also posted onto Open Lab this outline. And this is a very generic, basic outline of the major parts of a research report. And each of these do more than likely will not be of equal size. Certain ones will be larger than the others. Um, let's work through them quickly to give you an idea again just about what is involved in each of these and where you need to focus uh, for your research, the material that you learn about the problem and the solutions. So the introduction is basically you setting out maybe in a paragraph or two um, what the problem is and maybe some basic outline of the problems, background, and context, and some of the possible solutions that you've researched. So the introduction is not something you write until later in the process, because you need to have an idea about what research you find before you can begin writing how you're going to introduce it. Think of the introduction as your roadmap for the rest of the report. You're going to lay out for the reader what are the different sections that, they, that they're going to read in the subsequent parts and just maybe a sentence or two about each of those. So again, the introduction should be your roadmap and lay out the basics for what follows in the rest of the report. Now the objectives will be a very short section in which you basically state 
that the purpose of this research report is to present um, background research on the problem, you say what the problem is, and some of its solutions. And based on this research, to provide recommendations about how to solve this problem in the future. That's it. The method. This section again is very short, but you know, depending on doing these kinds of uh, research reports in the workplace uh, later on, the method section could be much more advanced. But in, for our purposes, the methodology is primarily to do secondary research using library and possibly web-based um, searches for information. Um, and you can talk about how you vet information, which I'm going to talk about in just a second in the next part of the lecture. Uh, but the method is like how you did the things to make this report possible. You can talk about how you work collaboratively. You can talk about how you use different resources like the library's databases, maybe Google uh, Advanced Search, um, maybe the New York Times. And also you can even write about how you collaborated together. You can write about how you used um, WhatsApp to have a back channel for your team's communication how you use Google Drive and Google Docs to collect your research and to write research together. Now, the next part is results. And the result is where you present um, the main parts of your research. And as I said before, this outline doesn't have to be strictly adhered to. You might combine some of these. So like results and discussion you might consider combining because the results typically should only present what you find. And this will be where you um, provide like maybe a sentence or two saying this research by such and such researchers at this institution or representing this group found that comma quote and then you give a big quote of that information and then you end quote it and then give your parenthetical citation. And then down in the references, you give your references bibliographic entry for that um, source. And so the result will be like, you know, some sort of, um, you might uh, provide some sort of hierarchy, some sort of outline, um, headings, in order to categorize the different findings that you have. Basically, that's where you're going to be using a little bit of your own writing to present the quoted material that provides the evidence for your report. The discussion is where you talk about your findings in your own words, like you explain what it means. And so I would suggest for your project that you have one section that's, that's titled Results and Discussion. That way you can present a quote or present some data and then immediately follow it with your discussion. That way people aren't having to like flip back and forth between these two sections. But I do want you to be aware that depending on the research you do in the workplace after City Tech, that these are distinct sections and the results would be something distinct from discussion if you're doing your own research, like in your own lab, for example. Um, but when you're doing this broad overview type research using secondary sources through databases, books, Google, um, then combining them may make more logical sense and make, it, make the presentation of your research easier to understand for your reader. Because again, all technical writing is all about your audience. You want to make sure the things that you're presenting to them is easy to understand, easy to follow, that's useful to them. So combining results and discussion is my official recommendation. Now the next section, after you've presented your findings from research and discussed it in your own words, meaning, again, discussion is where you explain it to us. Why is this relevant? How is this important? you give conclusions. And the conclusion section is where you uh, draw some conclusions from the findings 
of this research that you've done. So the conclusions as far as the problem are concerned might be uh, how big a problem this is or who specifically this problem affects. It also should include um, the, uh, an overview of the different solutions in terms of like you know, which solutions to the problem seem to work the best, which ones work the poorest, uh, which ones uh, have yet to be tested because in your research you might find solutions that haven't actually been implemented yet and so you could discuss you could uh, in a sense have that as a part of the conclusion say these are some possible solutions that haven't been tried yet or haven't been tested yet then in recommendations this is going to be you know, maybe a more substantial um, section than those very first ones like introduction objectives method but it still won't be like super huge not as big as um, results discussion and conclusions but the recommendations is where you finally say based on all that research you've done what do you recommend is the best possible solution to this problem or what is maybe the best solution in different circumstances so the solution for like maybe one group or one situation might be best but there might be a better solution for a different group or a different situation and you could distinguish that in your recommendation section and then finally you got references this is where you have all of your works um, that you have quoted from listed in APA format uh, alphabetically by the first author's last name um, and again, use the Purdue OWL, O-W-L, APA website uh, to see how to do the parenthetical citations for all your quotes and how to do those reference entries at the end of your document. Now, your research report can also have an appendix. An appendix is where you put um, other useful bits of information that may not be necessary to include in the body of your research report but that are available at the end for people to refer to uh, if they need to look up some more information, like say a glossary, like you included possibly uh, in your um, um, instruction manual, uh, or maybe even like sections about expanded definitions. Again, trying to think about how the earlier work you've done in our class relates to this larger project. And so for uh, your problem might involve a big term or an important term in your field. Well, why not write a expanded definition, maybe a shorter one than what you did on our, our earlier project, but with the same idea in mind where you give definitions, explain like you know, what they mean, and maybe give some quotes from other sources about how that word gets used in context relevant to the problem and the solutions that you're researching, right? I mean, you see how it's starting to come together, how you can rely on these other types of documents that you've produced to create more technical writing that goes into your research report. So again, th this is a basic outline. In, in the previous lecture, uh, on the lecture notes, I gave you links uh, to David McMurray's site and I gave you links to examples by students in my earlier my previous classes uh, look at those get some ideas about how they did things uh, or how they present things um, for your own project because I mean it's perfectly fine to get some ideas from those but of course all your writing for the project needs to be your team's work uh, your research now doing research. Um, so previously I had mentioned that optionally you can do your own primary research like you're know, doing a poll, um, asking people for like to do interviews and ask them questions and then you can quote what they say that would be perfectly fine but primarily this is secondary research project that should involve library sources um, involving the databases uh, the ebooks that we have access to. Um, but in a lot of cases, you might also need to do some online research uh, using uh, online sources that you can just simply find through uh, Google Advanced Search, which we'll take a look at. Um, you can use other search engines, which is fine too. But 
and this is something I can't stress heavily enough, is that you're going to have to vet, you're going to have to evaluate the sources that you include. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide in just a second. Um, but just as a reminder for the library sources, um, remember the library's website, library.citytech.cuny.edu. As soon as you land here, you can search right here for ebooks. To find articles in the databases, just click on Find Articles on the left. That's the easiest way. And then from here, you can go into different databases. Um, broad databases might include Academic One File by Gale and Academic Search Complete by EBSCO. Uh, you can also go um, to I, and there's IEEE Explore. Uh, you can go to S, and there's Science Direct. You can go to L and find LexisNexis, which searches like trade publications and magazines and newspapers. Um, you might find some things in these other databases, uh, depending on what your problem is that you're researching, but there's JSTOR, and there's also under P, Project Muse. And of course, any of these databases are fair game, but I just wanted to give you a few like go-to sources that you're more than likely going to be able to find things quickly and easily. Now, as a part of your research, you need to be uh, keeping a separate Google Doc in your team's shared folder. Um, again, your team should have set up a Google Drive folder where you're putting all of your work. Uh, there should be one document in there that's for the research report itself. But then inside the folder, you can have other documents. One of those documents should just simply be titled keywords. And in this document, keep a list uh, of all the different keywords that your team are using to do research. Because you're going to find through your research, through what you learn about the problem and its solutions, is that there are certain keywords that are relevant, others that may help you narrow down what you find in your research and you're also going to find other keywords that are irrelevant that you thought were useful at first but you actually find out were not. So make sure that you keep track of that and that you share that with your team members because knowing what keywords work and which ones don't can actually help you make your research time more productive because as you learn what are effective keywords and which are not you want to keep using the effective ones and not use the ones that are ineffective. So keep track of that with a separate document. Also, one thing that I, I didn't mention in our last class is with that Google Shared folder, that can be a central repository for all of the articles that you find um, and also different web sources that you find. So what I'm thinking here is like when you are you go to the databases, so like let's say I'm on the databases, I go to Academic Search Complete, um, let me log in, what if I were to write my research report on Moore's Law? So what if I were to write my research report on Moore's Law? Um, you know, the idea that um, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles about every two years. Um, you know, the, the problem obviously being is that at a certain point, um, we're getting too small to pack any more transistors because we're getting down to the, you know, the level of atoms um, rather than like you know, larger like uh, molecules, right? So this is a problem. Well, if I go to Academic Search Complete and um, type in Moore's Law, you know, I'm getting some sources here. And uh, they're coming from different places, which is fine. And I'm not going to go into details that I've already shown you in earlier lectures about doing research, about how to narrow things down, like with full text, uh, narrowing down the years, changing the source types, which I would recommend to academic journals so that you're getting peer-reviewed results. Um, but just be mindful that these things are there to help you 
restrict what you're seeing so you're seeing higher quality research uh, coming up in your searches. Uh, but like, for example, uh, what if I were to go to this first one, which has a PDF full text? So I click on that and it gives me the PDF right here. Well, I could download this. See, there's a download icon here or like if um, this opens as a PDF in whatever web browser you might be using, there should be an option to download it. Download that to your computer, but then upload that PDF to your Google Drive shared folder. Excuse me. That way, everyone in your team will have access to that file. You might even make a subdirectory in your Google Drive shared folder that's just for research and you, everybody can upload their PDFs into that space. But remember, as you're doing research, make sure you get all of the bibliographic information while you're on the database website. Um, and when we're talking about Academic Search Complete, uh, it gives you an option for citing it at the folder, ah, right, this icon right here on the right. And it gives you the citation format in a lot of different ways. And we're using APA. So make sure you copy this. Copy. Go back over into that document that you're actually using for your research report and add this to the references list at the end. Um, if you're not sure whether this will actually wind up in the research report itself, uh, but you want others in the team to see it first, you maybe just put it in that keywords document or maybe make another document in your Google Drive shared folder uh, for sources. And that would be where you can all put together in the same place um, the bibliographic information that would go into your references. Uh, because everything that you quote in your, do in your um, research report needs to be both quoted, have parenthetical citations, and a reference at the end. With this uh, particular research report, I don't want to see paraphrasing. I want to see quotes, and I want to see your discussion of those quotes in your own words. So don't do any paraphrasing in the research report. Rely on quoted material. Um, and remember also, I've mentioned this to some students in feedback on your earlier work, occasionally you're going to find quotes inside of a document that quotes someone else. If you go to the Purdue OWL APA website, you will find there is a specific way to cite that material that's been quoted from somewhere else in the actual document that you're looking at. Um, if anybody has questions about how to do that, that's why I have office hours. I can help you with that. Uh, but also that information is out there. It's called an indirect quote. That's also fine. Uh, but make sure you, you document it correctly in the right format for the parenthetical citation, QTD, period, space, in, space, and then the source you're looking at, and then, of course, the reference for this at the end of your document. So with this uh, research you do in the databases, in the ebooks, make sure you're documenting all this, that you're making copies of things that you can share with your teammates, and use Google Drive as the place to bring all that together. Because any documents that you put in that folder that you've shared together, everybody can edit those documents. So everybody is able to copy and paste and write things in those documents. And you can also upload files like PDFs. Now, another thing that you can do is for some of your research, you're going to have to use Google, um, especially like if you're researching, like, let's say a company and you're wanting to find out maybe more about like something on the company's website. Well, I would recommend not just landing right at Google and using it. Go to Google.com. And you'll see in the lower right hand corner there's this link for settings. Click that and then go to advanced search. Advanced search gives you more control over what you're going to be looking for. 
Uh, and in particular, using like this exact word or phrase helps you narrow things down rather than looking for a page that has all of the different key words um, not linked together, so to speak. Um, you can also exclude words, like none of these words. So like once you find out key words that are irrelevant or aren't helpful, you might plug some of those in there. Uh, but you can also narrow things down by language, um, by region, how uh, frequently it had been updated last. Uh, also importantly, site or domain. So if, like let's say you're writing about a problem or re uh, related to Microsoft Windows. Well, why don't you begin some of your searches by looking at Microsoft.com. You can just type in Microsoft.com in site or domain and this exact word or phrase, how about, um, I don't know, we'll just say malware, something very generic. Um, and then when I hit advanced search, it's only going to bring up pages on Microsoft.com with the keyword malware on them. You see there's obviously a lot, right? Um, but advanced search will help you narrow things down. But now, I've mentioned before that you can use your Google Drive shared folder to collect all your research together. Well, how about I go, like this first link, how malware can affect your PC. Well, this has a video, but it has a lot of text on here too that you might want to quote, like you know, maybe a sentence or two from. Well, one thing you could do is copy this link and put that into uh, you know, a Google Doc so that people can find that link and look at that again so that they not only can look at the, the research by what's written on the page, but they can also get all of the information for writing the bibliographic entry if you quote from this page, right? Well, it's another thing you might consider doing that may make things more helpful to you. Get rid of this guy. And that is uh, to print the page. So like here, I'm using uh, Firefox. So I can press Alt on the keyboard so I get my menu, and then File and choose Print. And I can save this as a PDF. Save that PDF to my computer, and then upload that PDF to my Google Drive share folder with my team so that everybody can just simply look at that PDF rather than referring back to the website, especially if like a website were, or web page rather, were to be deleted or changed you have access to what was there before. So again, these are just strategies to try to help with your research so that you don't lose things. But now, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention uh, with today's lecture has to do with how you write about the research that you're doing in the research report. So for every source that you're quoting from, you need to also include information writing in your own words that evaluates or vets your source. So you need to contextualize the sources of information that go into your research report. Like you know, who's providing it? Was this uh, a quote from Microsoft.com that was written by an unnamed uh, writer? You know, someone who's just on staff at Microsoft? Or was this written by a particular individual that may be like you know, an executive or a research scientist at Microsoft? I don't know. You go back to that page you looked at and find that out and say that as a part of your introduction for the quote. Like you might say, uh, according to VP so-and-so of Microsoft Research, comma, quote, give their quote, end quote, and then give that parenthetical citation at the end, and then down in your references at the end of your document, give the bibliographic entry for that web page. Good enough. The same is true for the documents, uh, the articles that you find through the databases, or even like, say, uh, an excerpt from an ebook. You want to say, who wrote it? Um, you know, did they say in that document, you know, what this research is a part of. Was it something funded by a grant? Was it something funded by a company? I don't know, but that's what you need to look into so that you can contextualize that research. It lets your reader know, how should I value this? 
is this really vetted information that's like peer-reviewed research from an, a scholarly academic journal or is it from like a trade publication or from a corporate website that may have been authored by the company itself which not to say that information is bad but we do need to take that with a grain of salt when that research isn't necessarily um, provided without like some ulterior motive behind it um, because like when research is peer-reviewed then this is like pure research pre you know true science taking place right but whenever something's written on like a corporate website uh, through a trade publication there could be other you know reasons behind why this is being published and so the more information you can provide to your reader about where this research comes from where this quote comes from who wrote it why they wrote it what's it a part of helps us evaluate on our own as readers whether we should trust this completely or not and that should also be an indication to you how much should you trust it as a part of your discussion as a part of your conclusions and as a part of your recommendations because if there's questions about where this research comes from obviously that should weigh on your minds when you're writing this report so it's a good cue for you to evaluate these sources uh, but it's also helpful to your reader to equally evaluate the sources that you decide to use which you can reflect on you whether it be positively or negatively because like if you are pulling a lot of uh, quotes and information from just rando websites by you know God knows who wrote them well I'm not really going to trust your research report nobody would so I mean this information should help you guide your research so that you're providing good vetted research uh, but then again it's something that helps your audience uh, evaluate uh, your own research so peer-reviewed academic scholarly research is like the gold standard um, you can in some cases appeal to authority if like say um, it has to do with something that's authored by like you know a company's research scientist or you know an executive but again there's always that possibility of ulterior motive there that you need to be mindful of um, but if it's coming from a rando website or somebody's YouTube video what authority do these sources have you need to establish that for us and if you can't establish it that is not a good resource to quote from okay and authority has more to do with like what someone what their background training is in um, what they know what they've been recognized for in their field um, but uh, issues of authority do not relate to how many YouTube subscribers you have for example that is not an accurate measure of someone's authority uh, on a particular subject uh, other issues like you can talk about reliability like is the research you're finding from a particular source consistent or is it like all over the place because if it's all over the place it's not very consistent so it may not be very reliable and also about validity like how accurate is that information being provided and do they provide some like evaluation of that in the document you're looking at and you can ask that and look at it and if you can't that may be a source you don't want to use um, another way of looking at this uh, this comes from the University of uh, Georgia Libraries website is they provide like these medals uh, for different types of research uh, they say you know a reliable source is one that provides a thorough well-reasoned theory argument discussion etc based on strong evidence right so like the gold medal goes to scholarly peer-reviewed articles or books the silver medal goes to trade or professional articles or books which again you can use these but you need to kind of explain where this stuff is coming from in your research report the bronze medal goes to magazine articles books and newspaper articles from well-established newspapers like the New York Times very useful but again that's not the same standard as the gold standard which is peer-reviewed articles we look a little bit further down we have a joker card next to websites and blogs um, they're 
may be some of these that have really high quality information. Uh, like for example, like I have a PhD, I have a lot of training both professionally, you know, outside my field like in IT, uh, but also obviously have the, re the background training that got me my PhD on my website. So someone could look at my website and I clearly say who I am, what my background is, and that tells them something about whether they should trust what I have to say. But a lot of websites, you have no idea who's, who's writing it, who's behind it, in which case that's probably not as reliable. And even in cases where it is clearly identified who is the author, you may want to ask questions about you know, who is this person? Do they have an ulterior motive behind why they're presenting particular information in a particular way? Because um, if it's not evaluated by an objective third party, as in the case of peer review, um, it's just not simply you know, as strong evidence. Uh, it needs to have that, that is essentially that trial by fire in order to show that it's something that's been vetted by other professionals. And then finally, they, get, they just give a Wikipedia award to Wikipedia that some articles are reliable, some are not. And it's again, up to you to evaluate. And a good way to evaluate Wikipedia articles is to look at those sources that are cited. Because again, as I've said before, Wikipedia aggregates information, meaning it pulls information in from other places. It isn't the originator of any of that knowledge that goes into those pages. That's true for any encyclopedia. Um, but for Wikipedia, anybody can contribute. Anonymous people can contribute. You don't even have to have an account in order to contribute to those pages. So the idea here is you can certainly learn things from Wikipedia, but I don't want you to be quoting from it, partly because Wikipedia pages change all the time as they get edited. So the thing you quote may not be there tomorrow, but also because that's not where that knowledge originates. You need to go out and you can use Wikipedia as a place to find sources that you can research through the library because many of those sources you find linked on Wikipedia actually go to journals in which case you can then follow that link find it through the library then you can say this is peer-reviewed research uh, you don't have to say that you found it through Wikipedia um, because you know, Wikipedia is a source that can lead you to new information but you're not going to be quoting that source from Wikipedia. You're going to quote it from the actual article that may have been linked from Wikipedia. All right, so let's go ahead and close this up. So for homework this week, you should have, you know, hopefully by today, as a team, decided what your problem is that you're researching for your report. If you haven't done that, again, reach out to all your team members, get everybody on board, multiple emails, uh, to decide on how you're going to back channel your communication, whether it be on WhatsApp, text messaging, whatever it might be. Uh, figure that out and get that established so that you can then discuss and decide on the problem you're going to be researching for the research report. That big core part that makes everything else possible on the collaborative team-based project. Um, so for homeworker, you decide on the problem, you begin doing your research. Again, Everybody in the team has to equally contribute the writing to that research report. A big part of that writing is going to be the quotes that you include as well as your discussion of those quotes. Again, the work you did earlier in the semester on summarizing articles and also of discussing things like comparing and contrasting things in your expanded definition project are going to feed into the writing you do on the research report of all the research that you do that goes into it. So each uh, this leads into the weekly writing assignment. So this is an individual writing assignment, okay? Each team member should independently write a short memo describing what research they will contribute or have found so far for the team's research report. I don't want you to like include quotes or anything like that. Just tell me how you've divided up the research, like is everybody researching the same thing, the same keyword or the same problem, or are some team members researching the problem and others researching solutions, or are all team members researching both the problem and solutions? 
All of these are perfectly fair game. You as a team get to decide how to do that. Let me know what it is you've decided and then tell me a little bit about what you found so far as a part of your research. And again, I can't stress this enough. You know, I've talked about it earlier in the semester, but I want to remind you all about it. Remember, this is a three hour class, right? This lecture uh, this week is probably going to be maybe an hour and a half. I haven't looked exactly, but roughly in that ballpark. So just as a matter of how much class time we have, I'm expecting you always to spend the full three hours on classwork. But there's also that expectation for every class that you take at City Tech that you're spending twice as much time outside of class on your homework assignments. So for a three-hour class, you're supposed to be spending six hours per week on your homework. That includes readings, that includes uh, writing assignments, that includes projects. And, you know, I mean, just to be honest, I, I think there's a, probably a large percentage of folks in the class that haven't been really following that rule based on some of the work that I've seen you do so far in the semester. It's absolutely imperative on this team-based project that you're expending that time on your research to make this project possible. Because if you're not spending time doing the research, learning about the problem and solutions, and then writing the research report, and then eventually what I'll talk about next week about preparing your uh, presentation, building the website, um, you, you're going to have a, a much less successful project and you're going to be unhappy with your grade. It's important, it's imperative, it's essential that you're putting in the time to do this kind of work. This is work you've prepared for. You know how to do research. You've done this in English 1101, 1121, and in our class so far this semester. So make use of these resources that I pointed out as like you, you won't have access to when, once you graduate. Use them now to enrich your learning, not just for our project, but for everything else you want to know about it for your career or maybe to learn about other things that you may want to do later in life. Make use of this. Okay, I can't stress that enough. It's, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing to me, the access to information that you have. But the thing to access that information is it requires time and energy on your part. So take advantage of it. Uh, next week, we're going to discuss the other parts of the uh, project, the other deliverables, just to give you a heads up. Um, but make sure that you're you're watching the lectures completely so you get all the details on all the past stuff as well as what we're working on right now email me if you got questions remember i have my office hours wednesdays 3 to 5 p.m remember to keep wearing a mask in public that you're socially distancing when you're around others that you get an appointment for a vaccination as soon as you can um, that uh, you're staying healthy make sure you're getting plenty of rest eat well, all of these things to get through the semester, to get all the work done the semester so that you're successful, it's done, you get out of City Tech, you have successful careers, and you know, once you're like you got you're getting that big paycheck, come back, pay me a visit. Hopefully by then we're gonna be back on campus. You can take me out to dinner one night or something. Uh, and we'll talk, you know, we'll com you know, um, commiserate about your time at City Tech and like the great success that you've had in life. Um, but in order to get to that point, you got to do this work that's going to pay off in the long run, I guarantee you. So if uh, you got anything, make sure you email me, jls at citytech.cuny.edu. Uh, reach out to your team members, get them all on board, uh, and uh, you know, take care. I will talk with you all again real soon.